Luke chapter 23 is where we're studying right now. In Luke 23, we, we saw that even in those terrible times as Jesus was heading toward Calvary, I was going to say he was carrying his cross, but he was too tired to even carry his cross. So somebody else, Cyrus, was carrying the cross. But, the, but as Jesus was walking along, we saw that, that he is the green tree. He's the one that, that in the parable, in the picture that he presents, he's forever the green tree. He's always growing. Even when he's dying, he's growing. And, and a picture, again, to me, that, that, look, it doesn't matter what you're going through or what you're heading toward or how old you are or whatever, you don't ever have to quit growing. You can keep growing. You should keep growing. Though the outer man perishes, the inner man being renewed day by day, and Jesus is the green tree. He's the picture of someone who's just growing every step along the way. Even as he's headed toward death, he's growing. And he's forever bearing fruit. You know, the, the, the beautiful picture that, that even there on the cross, as we move toward those, those verses that you're all so familiar with, as he hangs there upon the cross, even in that place, those, those lifeless beams of wood, even there they turned into fruit-bearing branches because he was there. And there on the cross, talk about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You see those fruit. If you, if you take his word in, you can taste the fruit. Even there on the cross, he's the green tree that, again, he could be cut down. He was cut down. But he, but he couldn't be burnt. There wasn't that fuel, it wasn't that fire, it wasn't that burning sort of stuff within. Instead, there was life. There was that fullness of life that, again, he pictures himself as the green tree. I'm getting cut down, but I'm not burning up. I'm not going to be one who's going to be all caught up in the flames of, of what was happening in the world around him. Because then, just like now, maybe more than now, all of the political uproar, all of the stuff like we sang from Psalm 2, why is this world in an uproar? All of this stuff going on, and Jesus was walking through it, and he was the green tree, and he wasn't about to burn. And so reminding you of that, looking and then moving a bit further. Again, as always, it's not, it's not only to admire Jesus. That's probably one of the best things we could do when we come here is just admire him, worship him, get to know him. But I also want to be like him. Man, I, 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 want, I want some of these things that are still small. I'm not getting emotional. I'm just about to cough. Later I'll get emotional, but <coughs> excuse me things that are still smoldering and burning and, and at work within me. I, I want that water of life, that Jesus is just full of the water of life. He's the, he's the green tree. That's what we've been looking at. Let's look at it again, where it says in verse 27, Luke 23, verse 27, there were following him a great multitude of the people <clears throat> and of the women who were mourning and lamenting him. And Jesus took the time and the strength to actually turn to them, and he said, daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but do weep for yourselves and for your children. He wasn't rebuking them like they were wrong. He was simply saying, the direction in which your tears are being turned, turn toward me, it's not necessary. I don't need your tears. I don't need those waters being turned in my direction. And, and like a... a good farmer channeling the waters, which field gets the waters, or, or a fireman, where, where's the burning the worst? Where do you need the water to go? Jesus is saying, not that way. He turns off that valve. Don't, don't weep for me. But there is a place. There's a barren, dry, troubled place that needs your tears, that needs that water. And so he directs the waters. He directs the tears to where they were most needed. Weep for yourselves. And for the next generation, for your children. He could see what was happening then and he knew what was going to be happening within the next generation. So he says, turn the tears that direction. He said, behold, days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren. 
A total contrast to how this book begins where you have this barren woman, Elizabeth, just so distraught. There's a time's going to come where you're going to say, I'm glad I didn't have any kids because the world around is going to be in so much flame and uproar. Right there, Jerusalem, the city of peace. Anything but peace. Jesus sees it coming. The days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. And they'll begin to say, as, as in Hosea the prophet, they'll say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green tree, if they do these things to the green tree, what's going to happen with the dry? Jesus is saying, look, you see what's happening to me, but I'm the green tree. I didn't bring this on myself. I wasn't the one who, who was trying to start a fire and called the fire down on my own head. I, I'm not a Barabbas. I'm not a, a, an insurrectionist. I'm not a rabble rouser, not politically. His, his way, he, he didn't cry out. He didn't have his voice heard in the streets, we're told. The, the spirit of God that was upon him was, was such that even a smoldering wick he wouldn't put out. He wasn't going to fan the flames and get, get a lot of excitement going. Or earlier that week, when everyone's waving their political palm branches, which is what they were, it was a symbol of Jewish nationalism, and they're all saying, Hosanna, the son of David, yes, our Jewish king, son of David, the Messiah, and they're all excited, and, and Jesus wept. He cried over the city at that time, and, and, and he wept over them, knowing what was, what was coming. He approached the city, he, he wept, he, he said, if you had known in this day, even you, the things that make for real peace. But that's been hidden from your eyes. Behold, the days shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank around you. They'll surround you. They'll hem you in on every side. They'll level you to the ground and your children within you. And they'll not leave in you one stone upon another because you didn't recognize the time of your visitation. That was just, what, five days earlier. And he's seeing the same thing, not, not because he's a prophet. I mean, he's more than a prophet. But he was just also, like any of us can be, a person with some insight saying, if things keep going the way they're going, I can tell where we're headed. I can see the kind of firestorm that's going to be stirring right here in this place if, if something doesn't change. And of course, after he wept, after he cried, then he started changing things. We're told that at that point he entered into the temple, began to cast over the tables. You know the story. And, and he said, it's written that my house shall be a, a house of prayer for all the Gentiles, for all the people. They'd set up this bazaar in the place where the, the Gentiles, Greeks, Romans, anyone, Samaritans, they could come and pray in that place. But no, nah, it was, it was a, more of a convenience stand. It was more of a, a bazaar thing. There And Jesus said, this is supposed to be a, a, a place of hospitality and welcome for, for all the non-Jews. Those are the things that make for peace. They weren't doing that. So Jesus tells the women who are weeping toward him, he says, weep where I weep. I'm weeping for your kids. I'm weeping for the future. I'm weeping for something that, that I see. And, and he encouraged them to do the same. You know, I don't think prayers are ever wasted if, if we're sincerely seeking the Lord. And I don't think tears are wasted if in the same sense we're seeking the Lord. Now sometimes you feel like, oh, you know, you can see it. it's going to happen. The writing's on the wall. It's already, it's inevitable. It's, you know, if you think that way, sometimes I think that way, you're never going to pray. You're never going to do anything. It's like, oh, it's just, it's inevitable. No. Even, even though God knows the future, he doesn't tell us what it is. And, and Jesus, as the Son of Man, didn't see in that way. He said, I, you, know, you ask me about the end, I don't know. The angels don't know. Only the Father knows about the end times that you want to know about. But he, he could see what was happening around him, and he could see where things were heading, and he prayed, and he wept. And you know what happened anyway. You know, again, we're sitting here a couple thousand years later, and it's like... Phew, yeah, talk about a firestorm. Talk about the great revolt, as they called it. Talk about an uprising that leveled the city of Jerusalem. But was it inevitable? Again, you know, pray, weep. Maybe even if it does happen, maybe it'll happen five years later or ten years later. Or maybe it won't happen to your kids. It doesn't mean that you're happy because it happens to your grandkids. But the, the point is not to say, look, it's just, 
You know, it's all going to hell in a handbasket. I saw it on CNN last night. I know it's true. You know, this is where it's headed. It's, you know, look, just read history and you know where we're... Instead of doing that, weep. There's a lot of good reasons to weep, especially for the women, that, 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 especially in that time, I should say, where women didn't have a whole lot of power, but they, they had a whole lot of influence, even in those days. And, and kids are affected, husbands, men are affected by the sympathy and the tenderness that these mothers might have. So weep and cry, and, and who knows? Even though in 70 AD the city was destroyed, may, maybe it would have been in 50 AD had not these women started weeping and crying and saying, you know, we just can't keep going down this road. But prayers weren't, weren't wasted. Yours aren't. Your tears aren't wasted. Don't, don't think it has to go down the way the news seems to make it seem like it's going to go down. And even if it goes down that way eventually, it doesn't mean that your prayers or your tears were wasted. But for the history, as far as they go, just to bring you up to speed, just to remind you again, it's terrible history. But the revolt started in 66 AD. And that's, that almost seems kind of faded, 66. But you know, they didn't number it. And it was in Caesarea, 66, Caesarea. Surely some, oh, never mind. It's too, I, I lost an hour, I don't know where it went, but um, it, it did. Start in 66 AD. It started with the same kind of stuff that was already going on. Everyone's ticked off at everyone else. Everyone's got their own little faction, their own little group. Everyone thinks they're right and you're wrong. And if everyone could just go along with me, we'd finally have peace. And while Jesus wept over those times, and a lot of other people wept over it, that kind of fuel, that kind of fire kept smoldering and smoldering until it started to break out in 66 AD. And, and one of the clerks in the temple decided we're going to do things different. And, and the Romans said, oh, no, you're not going to do things different. And people started killing other people. And it really wasn't even so much go out and kill the Romans. It was go out and kill your fellow Jew who sympathizes with the Romans. It's a lot easier to get a hold of your neighbor who sympathizes with the Romans than to grab a Roman soldier. Always easier to kill your neighbor. Bear that in mind. <laughs> I don't like the bumper sticker on your car. I don't like the way you vote. I don't like the, you know. And they started killing each other. And there was all these different groups, the, the Zealots and the, and the, um, the uh, Sicarii. Uh, the, the original Cloak and Dagger, you know, we talk about Cloak and Dagger. This was one of the first organized groups that literally carried daggers in their cloaks. And they would whip it out in the middle of a party or something, <laughs> someplace, and they would murder, assassinate, kill. Terrorists, patriots, depends on which side you're on. But the Sicarii, they, they, they carried their daggers very much like the one Peter pulled out. You live by that, you're going to die by it. Something small, something big enough to kill you. Not, it's not, it's not you know, weapons of mass destruction. But those little sparks, those little daggers, that, all that started going. And again, um, we lost an hour, so I'm not going to give you a long history lesson. But if you... If you there's no excuse for not knowing history unless you just don't want to know it. But if you want to know it, you can research it for yourself. And it's one of the most depressing and familiar scenes around. All of these factions and groups killing each other in the city of Jerusalem. And people who are starving to death once the Romans finally come in. Because for a while there was victory. Oh, for a while, when the first Syrian legion came in, the, the Jews actually defeated them and got their standard. And, and it was like... It was like the Cinderella team wins the Super Bowl. They were so stoked in 66 AD, 67. The, the days of the Maccabees, we, you know, Israel's going to be great again. They were so full of themselves. Cause, but it was just, Rome had their own problems at that time. Nero was going crazy. And, but once they settled their problems in Rome, they came back with an iron hammer named Titus and smash. But it wasn't even just smash the Jews. The Jews were, were throttling each other in the city. Fires breaking out everywhere. And anyone that tries to run, because there's no food in the city, if they try to get out, then the Romans would crucify them. 500 a day outside the city. And, and again, it's, it's miserable. It's horrible history. If, if, if you thought that was your future, you'd be weeping for your kids. You'd be sad to think, man. Because, you know, you worry about your kids getting caught up in gangs. There's all kinds of gangs. There's all kinds of, of political movements. There's all kinds of things that people are getting all worked up over and they're going to they're gonna kill and they're going to die and they're going to 
just make another huge mess. Again, that's history. It happens, it happens, it happens. It's happening. But the Lord's always shown us a better way. It's not which side, it's, it's a better way. It's a better approach. Weeping over some things, even though it seems inevitable, pray. Maybe it doesn't have to happen that way. But being people of, of peace, being people like Jesus is. Again, th this, is, this is what we come here to do. Admire Jesus and then say, not, I call myself a Christian. I, I hope you call me a Christian. I hope I can actually, Christian means little Christ. It's not a banner we wave. It's, it's a person to be. I hope I become a little like Christ. I, I hope I can be a Christian. I hope I can be like Jesus is. And so he's the green tree, he's bearing fruit, all of this factions and fraying and splitting and all the brittleness and all of the firewood, it's building every generation. The drought goes on and on and on. Eventually, boom, firestorm. But Jesus is the green tree. And again, like Psalm 1, like we sang earlier, we can all be green trees. We can all, we can all be refreshed and refreshing. We can all be good news. So that's, that's how far we've read and, and seen. And then it says, verse 32, the two others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. And so there's that scene. You can picture it in your mind's eye in a moment, the three crosses, Jesus in the middle. He was always in the middle, it seems like. Here, even, even in his death, Jesus is the, the man in the middle. He's the mediator. He's, he's the one with... Two different, very different people on either side. And he's not choosing sides. He's there in the middle. He's the, he's the uh, peacemaker, the bridge builder, the one who will talk to either one of them who's willing to talk. There's Jesus in the place that belonged to Barabbas. Bear that in mind. Barabbas was supposed to be on that cross. It was supposed to be a symbol of the Romans saying, don't you ever mess with us, because they did that all the time. You take three murderers, three guys who maybe daggered somebody else, three people who were firebrands and trying to start the revolt. Barabbas was a leader of them. But Barabbas got set free. Jesus took his place. And if it wasn't Jesus there in the middle, you would have, <clears throat> you would have three political killers all up there. And it's a, and it's a complete and a, and a whole symbol, a symbol of... of Political protest, if that's the best you can do, you die there saying, we're against the Romans, we're united. All three of us say the same thing. Or if you're a Roman, it's a political message of, we will smash you. But either way, all three would have been of the same mind. And you know, sometimes when we think of, of we all got to be single-minded, don't forget that if we're all single-minded and we're still crazy, we're crazy. You know, single-minded is overrated. It's not that we all agree, it's do we agree about the right thing? And if Barabbas was where he should have been, all three would have agreed. And there would have been that same old familiar fight. These three dying for their cause. They would have been martyrs to some. They would have been good riddance to others. But how different it is when Jesus is, is in the middle. And we'll talk about that more. A lot of you know, Luke alone tells us a little story about that. But there's Jesus, even in his death, he takes a place that um, I hope in my life I can learn to take. To be in that place that maybe we're not all single-minded here, but you know what? I love you on the left. I love you on the right. And, and uh, let's, let's see if there's a way to, to find peace. Let's see if there's a way to bear fruit. Even in his death, that's the picture. And it says when they came to the place called the skull. Did you know that? That's where you, you guys came to the skull this morning. Calvary, the skull. They came to the place, and there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. They crucified him. That's all it says. Whatever physical torment, and there was plenty of physical torment in crucifixion, the Bible doesn't dwell on it. I'm not going to dwell on it. Even though we're going really slowly through this section, that's not the thing to dwell on. The physical sufferings was not the, the, the great point of anguish. It was something inside that we can relate to maybe even more. It was the things going on in his heart and, and soul. And so it simply gives that, that phrase, all three of them, they were crucified in that place. But Jesus was saying, not just once, but he was repeatedly saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. 
And the soldiers cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by looking on. And the rulers, they were sneering at him, saying, well, he saved others, let him save himself. If he's the Messiah of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also were making fun of him. They mocked, coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Because there was this inscription that was right there written above his head in all the common languages of the day. An inscription saying, this is the king of the Jews. And that was supposed to be a joke. And that was supposed to be an insult. But how true it is. And not just of the Jews only. He's the king of all free men. He's the king of all who would be free. God so loved the world, he gave us this king. One that we can vote for any given day, any given decision, any time something comes out of our mouth. Who's going to be Lord over this one? And there he is on the cross, the, the king. The king of kings. The, the true king. <laughs> and even in insult, <clears throat> he's the one that's right. Now, the statement I want to focus on here today is the one in red. At least in my Bible, it's in red. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That deserves to be in red. And it's one that you'll hear me say often because I need it. This is medicine for my soul. This, this is the water of life that I desperately need. What he did, I got to do. What he said, I got to learn to say. And it's the first of seven sayings, as you, depending on what your church tradition might be, there's often this uh, focus on the seven words or the seven sayings of Jesus there on the cross. Uh, composers like Haydn have written uh, whole pieces, books written about it, meditations on these seven sayings. Luke has three of them. Luke alone has three. John alone has three others. And Matthew and Mark have the seventh, have the one in the middle. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So of those, of those seven, certainly looking at the ones that Luke has, and focusing on, on this one here today. Because Jesus, in saying that, he's not just saying it. He's doing it. He's living it. He's bearing fruit. The peace, the patience, the kindness coming out of his mouth when he said that. And you know, the best we can ever do is to abide in him. Jesus said, if you just hang in there with me, you're going to bear a lot of fruit. Hanging in there with him. A lot of fruit. And so my intent here this morning is to take a very long drink from a very deep well. And then we'll sing some songs and you can think about it even more and mostly to think about what it means for you. Because this is the water of life that makes him the green tree. It's the water of life that will moisten any of us. And I, again, realize how often I need, I need that to, to moisten my tongue, to soften my lips when I'm about to say something very different. This, this is the water that'll keep you from burning and being burnt, and just being angry, and just fuming, and just starting the next fire. They, oh, you might, you might win, and after the scorched earth policy, you might say, we came out on top, but no. Just a lot of people got burnt. Here, here's the water of life that, that we need. You know, when that Roman soldier took the spear after Jesus was dead, a Roman soldier pierced his side, actually literally opened up his heart and physically you could see what was inside of his heart and John saw that as a miracle. Water and blood flowed out. And John saw that symbolically. The water of cleansing, the blood of atonement. That flowed from his physical heart. But when it comes to his moral heart, his heart of hearts, it wasn't a Roman spear that opened up, it was his mouth that opened it. Jesus said, the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. And you want to know what Jesus was saying on the cross? The first of the seven words, what Jesus was saying? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, whatever bad has happened to you, whatever has taken place in your life, again, here's what Jesus was saying. 
Here's what was in his heart. Here's what still is in his heart. And for my life, again, Lord, help me. You know, you can pray anytime when I'm talking. It's, it's okay. You can talk to him even when I'm talking to you. Some of you, you, I can see your eyes are closed and you're already deep in prayer. But this is about your relationship with God, which has everything to do with your relationship with people around you. And this is for you. And if you see something admirable about Jesus, you're right. He's wonderful. He's lovely. And if you want more of that in your own life, then I'm saying the same thing. I want this. I want these words, I want this water in my mouth. You know, I know sometimes when I've been laying there, especially if my wife's in another room, sometimes, you know, she goes in another room because she snores. I'm joking. I go in another room because I snore. And when I've been peaceably snoring all night long, laying there on my back, I'll wake up after, I don't know how many hours of doing that, and my tongue is like brittle, and my lips and everything is like, you know, little water. But sometimes when I'm wide awake, and maybe my heart and my soul is sleeping toward what really matters in life, there can be a dryness, and my tongue can be just about ready to start a fire. And again, this is the water. And, and what I'm learning, you know, when I was younger, I was younger yesterday. And I, I wanted to guzzle as much of life as I could get down. You know, just guzzle, guzzle, guzzle. But I'm learning to, to savor, and I like it. Some of the greatest pleasures of my life, just the simplest ones, just something I like to and hold it in my mouth and ask me a question and take a while because I gotta, I gotta swallow it, but I'm just holding it, I'm savoring it. And, and so that's how I see this scripture here today. And already I thought, well, we're just gonna look at one verse, we'll have plenty of time, and already I'm going way too long. So. But you can hold on to it if you hear it in your heart here today. We looked at the blame game a couple of weeks ago, and, and you could find seven different people, and ultimately everyone. We're all to blame for what happened to Christ, but when you hear the words of Jesus, game over. Because he to whom all the offense was given, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And if you bear in mind what we saw back at the end of chapter 22, the words of Jesus to that Jewish council who came to condemn him, they, they didn't come for justice, they came to condemn him. They already unjustly decided in the night. But first thing in the morning, they come with their condemnation. And Jesus said there in verse 69 of chapter 22, he said, from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. That was his one declaration, not a threat like, man, I'm coming back in power and you're in trouble. Because here's his heart. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's promising what we saw in Daniel, and I'm going to read it to you. Don't even flip there. I'm just going to read it to you because they all memorized it. They, they knew what he was saying. Daniel says, I kept looking until the thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat and the Ancient of Days was dressed in robes like white snow. His hair was like pure wool, the classic picture of God the Father. Daniel saw him and his throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire and a river of fire was flowing and coming out from him and thousands upon thousands of attending him, myriads upon myriads standing before him. You know, a picture, all fire and God the Father and all of that. And, and it says the courts sat and the books were opened. I mean, this is the big burn. This is the big judgment. The, the court sat, the big court sat and the books were opened. And then there's that little thing where the beast, the Antichrist is making a bunch of noise and Daniel says, no, I, I, I quit looking at that because he got destroyed. I'm going to look to the Christ. So I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the ancient of days, up to that place of fire. And he was presented before the ancient of days, this son of man. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, and all the peoples, Gentiles, nations, men of every language, that all would serve him. And his dominion lasts forever. It'll never pass away. His kingdom is one, no division. It'll never be destroyed. Now, when you know the Son of Man, it's Jesus. It's the one who's saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What a word of hope, even for his adversaries, even for the ones who would falsely judge him. There's the true judge, Jesus. And oh, man, what it does for my heart to know that he is the judge. 
regarding myself and regarding anyone else that I, I fear for what's going to happen to them. I don't fear. They're going to stand before Jesus, who says of, of the worst of us, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That doesn't mean that everyone's automatically forgiven because there's still, like love itself, there's a choice that's left. But as far as his heart goes, isn't it clear? No grudges, no vendetta, no sense of, well, you know, I'm going to teach you a lesson here. I've already loved you with an everlasting love. Will you receive it? Can you receive it? Will you accept it? That's always the good news. Can you accept that? But he's the judge. And when he says, Father, forgive them, it's not free pass. It's not full excuse. Again, if you've got an excuse, you don't need forgiveness. Everyone has to come to terms with what they've done. If you haven't done so yet, you've got to. He forgives and makes repentance possible because the goodness of God leads you to repentance. But you still have to come to terms with, with what you've done. But you're coming to terms before somebody who loves you and who holds no vendetta and is, isn't out to get you. And I'm just going to read you one more big fat passage of Scripture just to give you the picture of something that happened just seven weeks later. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And just seven weeks later, on the day of Pentecost, these same people, a lot of these very same people, they're in Jerusalem still. Less than two months later, there they are. And I, I won't read, I said I'd read a big fat piece of scripture. I'm just going to read a kind of fat. I'm cutting it down because already I'm going too long because I do that. But now we'll blame Peter because Peter's talking now. Peter says to the crowd, he says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you all know, you all saw this. You're all witnesses to this. You know it. This man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Yes, the Romans are the godless men. They did it, but you, they were just the hands that you used. You're responsible, he says. And then God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. He says, this Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses, Peter referring to himself and all those others that were speaking with these tongues of fire, not fiery, curse you kind of fire, but a very different kind of fire. And the crowds gather, and here's the message, this Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, all that picture of the Son of Man, he has poured forth this which you see today. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Again, you've you got to come to terms with that. You did it. And they did come to terms. When they heard it, they were pierced to the heart. They said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what are we going to do? He said, Change your mind. Repent. And then be baptized in the, in the waters in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And, and you'll even receive the same gift of the Holy Spirit that we've received. It's not, you know, sorry you missed out too late to, to get the full blessing. What he has, he has for all. You just got to change your mind and, and want it. And so again, you, you know the story. Peter said this promise is for you and for your kids, the ones that you probably should be weeping for, because if they don't receive this water, they're going to burn with something else. You know, so often we threaten with the fires of hell when, when the fires that would burn you are already working in your own heart and mind. And those are the ones that can be put out today. If you change your mind, change your heart. And so he says, this promise, that this, these waters of life, it's for you and for your kids and for all the Gentiles, for everyone as far off, as many as the Lord would call to himself. And with many words like that, he solemnly testified. He kept exhorting them, saying, be saved from this messed up generation. He said that a couple of months later, the same generation that Jesus was weeping over. And, you know, about 3,000 people came forward. And you know what? I bet you they weren't among those that were causing the fires in so many ways. Different kinds of fires, different kinds of waters. But Jerusalem was burnt to the ground. 
And some of those people and some of their kids and some of their grandkids weren't a part of it because you know what? They followed the Prince of Peace. They said, you know what? We're going to go a wholly different way. And so is it inevitable or is the world always going to have wars and rumors of wars and problems? Of course. But man, there's a lot of ways that we can receive the water of life. And um, the water is symbolic, of course, baptism, cleansing from sin, but, but symbolic of more than that. It's again the, the waters that put out the fires. And probably the first place to start is the very words that came from the mouth of Jesus. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Do you know how many fires that puts out inside of you if, if you can find the freedom? It's not freedom for them to get away with whatever because it doesn't work that way. It's freedom for you to, to let things go. Jesus is saying, Father, this is my heart as a man, as the son of man. My heart is not filled with anger, not filled with rage, not filled with vendetta, not filled with anything other than, Father, find a way. Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And again, they're going to have to come to terms with what they've done, just like those on the day of Pentecost and many days afterwards. But we all need that. They didn't know what they were doing. Oh, yes, they did. I can find parables. Jesus taught parables. They knew what they were doing. What do you mean they didn't know what they were doing? Of course they knew what they were doing. Pilate knew. It's for envy that they do this. But you know, ultimately, there's something about sin itself. It's, it's insane. It's crazy. I think though anyone who's fully aware and fully knowing is, is going to fully love God because God is fully aware and fully knowing. We don't have to mince words with it. I'm not saying anyone has a free pass or an excuse. It doesn't get anyone off the hook. In fact, the more you know, the more responsible you are. And that goes both ways. But the fact of the matter is, it's not for me to judge. It's for me to be free. And to say, no matter how much they knew or didn't know, they, they can't comprehend the fullness of what they've done. And for me, I got to let it go. It's not getting them off the hook. If you're hooked on something, you're hooked. If, if you've got something burning inside of you, that's your problem. But it's not my, I'm off the hook and I'm not going to burn anymore when I can learn like Jesus to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I can go one further than Jesus because Jesus did know what he was doing and he needed no forgiveness. I can double up on it. I can say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And oh, while you're at it, Father, forgive me because I don't know what I'm doing either. Rather than me saying, I'm, thank God I'm not like other men. I'm on the righteous side. And forgive those ignoramuses. It's like, Lord, you know what? Maybe I'm on the wrong side of this issue too. Maybe we're all on the wrong side of it. Maybe we're of one mind and we're all crazy. But, but Lord, because we got our issues, forgive us. Remember the prayer, Father, feed us, forgive us, deliver us. Not one segment, not one group, not one tribe, not one party. Feed us, forgive us, deliver us. So I thought we'd have a whole lot of time. We've got a little time. But let's take the time that we have to think for a second regarding our own lives. Where, where's the slow burn? Where's something, where's the smoldering issues someplace in our own life that maybe a few prayers of forgiveness will help us to be free? What tends to happen, and oftentimes you're not aware of it, until you have a good talk and suddenly you realize, wow, there were so many things smoldering under the surface. If you want to get a good fire going, you start by making factions. You start by splitting. You start by fraying. You start by dividing. You start by making fascia and bundles. And you get all of this stuff dry and brittle, and you don't even know it until a spark comes along that, wow, something was about to blow. So rather than wait for something to blow and go, wow, where did that come from? And it's not, I'm not just talking about in the world around. I'm talking about in your family and in your work and relationships. What, what's smoldering inside? Where are we divided? Where are we split? Where are we frayed? Where are we taking our stances rigidly, holding to something, and Christ would call us to something better? That, those are the questions. Those are the things to, to think about. Ask, seek, knock. We'll sing a couple of songs. But better than to read the Bible, that's good. Better than to study the Bible. That's even better. Let's do the Bible. Let's live it for a couple of songs here. Mm -hmm. 